Hi, horn players. I'm going to start today by talking about playing health. I definitely don't know everything about this topic, so I also want to point you toward a resource that a friend of mine, Jen Murata, created. Askaperformer.com is a website where musicians who've experienced and or recovered from injuries can write in with their stories and read the stories of others. Um, I'm not sure if it's been updated recently, but this is an important step in the brass world. Until very recently, it's been considered kind of taboo, like a sign of weakness for a musician to admit having an injury. They would worry about losing work, and many musicians who can't afford to lose work are forced to play through their injuries instead of being able to take, un, uh, you know, instead of, well, of taking un, unpaid time off to try to address them or, you know, having paid time where they're able to heal and recover. Some musicians are ashamed to let other performers know that they've had an injury, even if they've recovered from it years ago. But it's important for these stories to be collected and discussed so that hopefully future brass players can be taught protective techniques that prevent the most common ailments. Instead of talking to you about injuries today, a topic on which I'm not an expert, and by the way, I would advise anyone with a playing injury to seek out people who are experts, um, I'm really going to be presenting you with advice and exercises that I've collected and used over the years to keep the parts of my body that are heavily utilized during horn playing in the best working shape that I possibly can. Let's start with lip health. The first and most important thing is don't play if it hurts. If it hurts, stop, rest. These are delicate tissues that can be irreparably damaged. And if you don't believe me, I won't put it up here, but Google Louis Armstrong lips sometime. And then Google Louis Armstrong mouthpiece. His lips were so damaged, he actually saw grooves in his mouthpiece so that it essentially had a grip on his face. So after your face has had some time to recover, approach the horn and look carefully at your playing habits. Is there something you're doing that's not physically doing its job? Um, or there's something that you're not doing, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, causing the painful part of your embouchure to overwork. Buzz on the mouthpiece itself and see if the pain happens then. Are you using enough air? Are you holding the horn in a weird tilt, left or right or up or down? Um, are you using your pinky ring to pull the horn into your face, especially for high notes? I had a friend in college that used to call that the octave key, <laughs> but that is not the healthy way to play high notes. So these are all things you can look at if you start to feel face pain. Drinking water is incredible for your lip health. Um, I especially notice when I'm playing a lot that if I'm hydrated, playing is easier. And if I'm dehydrated, it's harder. Like my lips literally feel more plump when I'm hydrated. This is a big deal here in Colorado, which is ironically the least dry of the last three places I've lived, but very dry nonetheless. And the elevation doesn't help either. So stay hydrated and you'll play better. Um, my teacher Steve believes firmly in taking one day off per week when he's doing heavy playing and he also takes several full weeks off each year. It's healthy to give your, the muscles in your face these periodic intervals for recovery and it's also good for your mental health to step away from the horn from time to time and to think about something else or to do something fun even. <laughs> When Steve takes these breaks, he continues to do the face exercises that I learned from him at the University of Utah. Evidently, these face exercises come from an embouchure expert who helped injured players rebuild their broken embouchures. Steve says that if he takes a week or two off, but he does these exercises every day, sometimes it feels like he comes back a stronger player than when the break started. Um, I'm not nearly so dedicated or structured with these exercises as he 
is. Usually I'll do 10 to 15 rounds of stretch, contract, just to get a little blood flow to my lips before I start playing for the day. Or I'll do it absentmindedly while Adam and I are watching TV and freak him out. And he looks over and he's like, what are you? Oh, it's Steve's exercises. <laughs> because these are super gross to watch somebody else do. So I apologize for the demonstration I'm about to do. It will be a little weird. But hey, we're all wearing masks these days. So now you can go do these exercises while you walk down the street to class if you want. <laughs> Um, if I start to feel like my face is taking on too much playing abuse, that's maybe when I'll do this full method for a few weeks, just building up slowly over several days to doing the whole routine, just to make sure that everything is nice and strong. Um, even though, as you know, um, I really like uh, the tongue to be doing most of the work. So a lot of the times it's just that we're calling on our lips to do things that our tongue should be doing. Steve calls these strengthening exercises, but I like to think of them just as much as stretching exercises. One half stretch, one half strengthen. But take care never to overstretch or overpurse your lips. These are slow, gentle, gradual movements that primarily focus on the top lip. There are three steps to this process, but they all involve the same basic set of motions. If you do the whole run of 21 minutes, I recommend doing it at the end of the day because it can leave your face just feeling a little swollen. First, you'll move very slowly into a big smile. Sometimes I like to put my finger on my lip in the middle just to make sure I'm moving at a nice, uh, slow, and regular pace. Then just as slowly and with just as much control, return from the smile and move toward the center, focusing on the top lip, then hold for several seconds. This is basically the first step, which you'll start doing for one minute and then work up to seven minutes over several days. And notice I'm not going too far stretched or too far pursed. For the second step, it's the same motion, but you're going to take your thumbs and place them under your top lip, kind of like you're doing a weird walrus impression. <laughs> As you contract, contract your lip muscles toward the center, you'll actually feel this band of muscles working on top of your thumbs. Remember, don't overdo this. Everything gentle and slow. I'd probably, if I was doing this on my own, see if I could slow down that motion from the speed I was just doing. Same thing, you're gonna start at one minute, work up till seven. And for the last step, Steve uses a piece of medical gauze or a paper towel. He cuts it about one inch wide and about six inches long, so as long as a dollar bill. Then he rolls it up and he puts it under his top lip. Um, I like to use this polyfoam insulation I found at the hardware store. It's called caulk backing. I think you use it in place of caulking or maybe it's you help helps with caulking. What's great about this is that I can use each piece a few times before it loses its bounce. It's kind of spongy. Whereas gauze and paper towels get gross right away. So I'll take an inch, maybe a little bit more of this and put it under my top lip and do the same exercise starting with one minute and working up to seven minutes. Let's talk about jaw health. Our jaw is an interesting joint. There's nothing else like it in the rest of the body. It involves two layers of really strong muscles, and the whole area is influenced by the incredibly complex system of neck muscles that help support our head and connect it to our torso. Our jaw is only designed to hinge down and back up. It does have some slight play from side to side and front to back, but functionally the joint just has a down and up motion. And this type, type of joint is called a sliding hinge joint. There's a very important reason we don't want to move our jaw from side to side or front to back unnaturally. Um, between the mandible and the skull, there's a little disc of cartilage that can become displaced. If it does, you may suffer pain, loss of mobility, and potentially loss of the ability to play your instrument. So we want to take care of our jaw as much as we can. 
As you already know, um, I advocate for not dropping or popping out your jaw to play low notes, or at least only doing those things very minimally in the extreme lowest register. Um, per my teacher Steve's instruction, I use a forward low register tongue position to achieve those notes, which in my experience was a far more successful method for achieving those notes anyway. What I was trying to do with my jaw didn't really work. But this technique has the added benefit of protecting that joint. And I absolutely believe that before I met Steve, I was actively giving myself TMJ issues through the ill-advised way I was trying to play low notes. And like I said, unsuccessfully. There are a number of reasons that you might experience TMJ pain. Maybe it's joint misuse, like I've been talking about here. Or maybe it's hereditary, or perhaps you have some arthritis in that joint. Um, maybe you have some kind of food allergy that's causing inflammation. Um, wheat, uh, dairy, and soy are the three most common. Or maybe coffee is causing that joint to inflame. It could even be that you grind your teeth at night. For that last one, poss possibly, and for any severe case of TMJ, you should definitely see your dentist to get a mouth guard for sleeping, and they'll give you some advice on how to improve your general overall condition as well. But if you only get the occasional joint popping or discomfort, or if TMJ has just kind of popped up in your life suddenly, possibly due to added stress or pregnancy, um, then there are some self-care techniques that you can use to alleviate some of these issues on your own at home. If you drink coffee, give it up, drink it less often, or drink decaf. Make sure you're drinking enough water because mu muscle tightness can be a result of dehydration. Massage your neck and shoulder muscles regularly and make some kind of stretching exercise a part of your routine. Think about buying one of these S-curve back massagers. Um, this is one of my favorite tools for um, to target trigger points in my upper back. Make sure that your jaw is stable when it should be and simply hinges down and up when it is in motion. Here's some exercises to do in front of a mirror to make sure that your jaw is only moving down and up. If your jaw wants to move from side to side, um, slow down and use a controlled motion to hinge straight down and back up. Just like the face exercises, these are slow and gentle. Always return to a relaxed pose in between each rep. The first exercise is to inflate your cheeks to half full and hold for 10 seconds so your jaw shouldn't move. And you'll do five repetitions of that. The next exercise is to slowly kiss forward, then release into a relaxed position. So your jaw should not move forward, just your lips, and do that 10 times. The next exercise is to stick your tongue out just a little bit. Your jaw should only open slightly and do that 10 times. Lastly, put the tip of your tongue on your alveolar ridge inside your mouth. We all know where that part is now, the part of the roof of your mouth with all the kind of horizontal ridges that starts um, the big dome in the roof of your mouth. Um, I like to think of the alveolar ridge as the continental shelf of our mouths. So put the tip of your tongue right there in the middle of that alveolar ridge where it starts the, the tip up and then trace with the tip of your tongue back along the center line of the roof of your mouth, and your jaw will hinge down as you do this, then return to a relaxed position. So go nice and slow and watch yourself carefully in a mirror. Is your jaw wobbling from side to side or just moving up and down? And do that 10 times. Let's say that your jaw is kind of wobbling side to side. Um, here are some jaw stabilization exercises that Steve gave me. 
First, use two fingers to apply pressure on the left side of your jaw. You're gonna try to resist that pressure and to stay in a neutral position. And you're gonna do this for 10 seconds, um, five repetitions. Then you'll do the same thing on the right side of your jaw. <clears throat> Um, so that's also five repetitions of 10 seconds each. All of these will be. Then you're gonna press on the top of your chin with a gentle pressure downward. And again, you're trying to resist. Um, then press from under your jaw. This is kind of hard with two fingers. That might be better with thumbs. Lastly, on the chin again, but this time, instead of applying a pressure down, you're gonna be applying a pressure back, and remember to resist. If you do feel like you may be developing a case of TMJ, here are Steve's TMJ exercises that he does regularly. Um, I think he got the, these from his um, you know, dentist or TMJ specialist he goes to. He recommends getting a beach ball and inflating it halfway. That definitely works the best for these exercises, but in a pinch, I've used a supportive throw pillow. Um, but whatever you've got, sit on a couch and put it like between the back Back of the couch and your neck so you'll be leaning back kind of like this I'm gonna hold my head at an angle like this to try to kind of uh, simulate that general amount of support and then you'll do this series of exercises um, these are gonna help you make sure that whole complex system of neck muscles is engaged and working properly so I'm back like this First do 10 circles clockwise in a slow, small motion. Your chin should rotate and trace a circle about the size of a quarter. Go nice and slow and notice if you feel any hitches in your circle. Try to slow down at that point and the next time around and really work through it. So I'm gonna demonstrate this actually a little bit slower. And then you'll do 10 circles counterclockwise. Just teeny little circles. Turn your head, uh, this is the next exercise, gently from left to right. And again, I'm still kind of leaned back like this. Just the width of a quarter, 10 times. And then you'll move your chin slowly up and down 10 times, the width of a quarter to start. Lastly, and I think this one is the most fun, you're gonna trace the alphabet in small motions with your chin. So L, M, N, O, P. Now let's move on to tongue health. The tongue is the most independent muscle in our whole body. Think of all the different vowels and consonants it can create shapes for, and uh, the muscle is only attached on one side. So just like any muscle, your tongue can get cramps. Um, that happens to me sometimes if I'm doing a lot of multiple tonguing. Um, Steve has a few tongue exercises that I'll share with you. This first one is just like one of our TMJ exercises. You're gonna place the tip of your tongue on the alveolar ridge and then trace backward down the midline of the roof of your mouth 10 times. But this time, think about stretching that tongue muscle backwards. Steve's second exercise is to trace a triangle on the roof of your mouth with the peak being, again, at the alveolar ridge you're gonna trace it 10 times in one direction and then 10 times in the other direction. Lastly, on the tongue, I want to share with you, however gross it may be, my tongue stretches and tongue massage. Uh, it occurred to me a few years ago that the tongue is a muscle, maybe one that I use more than most of my voluntary muscles. Um, therefore, it could benefit from stretches and massage just like our other muscles. So here are a few tongue stretches that I came up with.
First, after you've done Steve's tracing exercises, then stick your tongue out um, way to one side, like you're reaching for your ear, and then you're gonna move it to the other side. Um, I'm really thinking about stretching the root of my tongue on each side as I do these like tongue side bends. So you can do this 10 times on each side, or you can just go back and forth uh, um, ten, a total of 10 times. Then you're going to stick your tongue out and reach down for your chin 10 times. Um, reach your tongue as straight out as you can and then um, return it out to your mouth 10 times is the next step. If you're capable of doing this, flip your tongue upside down from side to side 10 times each. Open your jaw wide and reach the tip of your tongue up to the roof of your mouth. This is stretching the underside of your tongue. And then lastly, here is my tongue massage. Maybe this sounds strange, probably is. <laughs> but sometimes my tongue feels like it doesn't want to stretch all the way out, like almost like it's there's a, the muscle is carrying tension that I don't want to be in there. So I developed a tongue massage to go along with my stretches. Um, there's no way you want to do this when anybody else can watch. It is completely slobbery and so gross. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of demonstrating for you directly, I'm going to use this kind of half-destroyed dog toy that I think kind of resembles a tongue. <laughs> um, I think it used to be a pair of snow boots <laughs> to show you um, a, the kind of tongue massage techniques I use. Um, important note, don't do anything that feels bad. This should be gentle and invigorating, not painful in any way. Um, the first thing I do is stick my tongue out kind of flat, um, not pointed like the muscle is engaged, right? So um, this is pointed, this is flat. Then I use my thumbs on the bottom and two fingers on the top, thumbs on the bottom, two fingers on the top. And then I kind of drag them down the body of the tongue. Your top fingers are gonna slide more easily um, than your thumbs will on the bottom, so be really gentle down there. You may just wanna do the dragging motion with your top fingers. You do that about five times. And you may notice that your tongue feels like it can stick out a little further every time you do this, because you're kind of stretching that tongue out long ways. The first few times, your tongue may feel really sensitive, but it'll probably feel better with every repetition. Um, maybe you want to do a few reps really slow where you like pick a spot and hold it and then you move slowly down to the next spot and hold it and then keep going until you get to the very end of your tongue. If you find an especially tender spot, which is what we call a trigger point, put a little pressure on it for a moment, then kind of swirl that spot lightly with a circular motion. That's how you release a trigger point or a place in your muscle where the fibers have started to bind together into a knot. Perhaps by the end of this part, you feel like the tip of your tongue stretches further than it did at the start of the massage, even the tip, not just the whole body of it. Next, I'm going to massage the length of the tongue but going down the sides instead of the top and the bottom. I use less pressure to start this step. So this is easiest to do one hand at a time using two fingers and your thumb. So you'll start at the back of your tongue like this and then slowly massage down toward the front. And if you alternate hands, then both sides will get the same amount of massage. And do this five times with each hand and it'll feel better with every rep. I think this feels really good and I also like this, to use this massage to stretch out and elongate the very end of my tongue. Um, the next thing I like to do is stick my tongue out to one side, like I'm trying to reach for my ear, and then massage the stretched side using the first two fingers of the opposite hand. So if I was stretching my tongue this way, then I'd be stretching the root with this hand. I'll start at the base of the tongue right here and work the whole side in an arc motion. 
So these are like the tongue side stretches, and then we're gonna encourage the muscle to stretch even more from the back to the front using our fingers. So do five on one side, five on the other. And lastly, and make sure your mouth is well lubricated for this one. I often like to have a glass of water nearby when I do this step. I like to take both of my thumbs, place them under my tongue in the back on both sides, and then almost like I'm trying to fold my tongue in half like a taco, run my, like this, run my thumbs down the length of my tongue on the bottom, pressing them toward each other. This is easier to show you without this. So kind of like this on the bottom. So I'm gonna take my thumbs on the bottom, fold it up like a taco, and then um, run the tongues down the bottom. Um, the top half of your tongue is gonna sort of bubble up. You might expect it to go down like a taco, but it's actually gonna do kind of like this boot is doing. It's gonna bubble up like that. Make sure you keep the skin under your tongue lubricated for this one. It's, it doesn't have the same kinds of glands as we do, and it gets damaged um, if, and, if, and stuck if you pull it too hard. After you do the massage, go back and try your stretches again. Can you reach further in certain directions this time than you could before? I usually can. Um, never overdo these as well. Always be safe rather than sorry. Next, we'll look at shoulder health. The horn is an asymmetrical instrument, meaning that we have a different arm position for each side. And many horn players suffer from chronic neck or shoulder problems and upper back pain. Um, I have shoulder pain on the right, some upper back pain. I've met horn players with shoulder or upper back pain on the left, probably from rolling our shoulders forward while we're playing. Um, so the first consideration if you're experiencing shoulder pain is your posture, both while you're playing and your everyday life. Make sure that you're kind of even instead of leaning from one side or the other. Here's a quick reset for your shoulders if they're giving you some grief. Up, back, and down. The up movement squeezes up or contracts some of those problem muscles in the shoulders and the lower trapezius. There's a theory that one way to remove tension from a muscle is to contract it very hard on purpose and then try to release it all at once. So that's part of this up, back, and down motion. <clears throat> the movement back, we go up, back stretches our pectoral muscles which want to tighten and constrict as we get older and that causes our shoulders to round forward that can put undue strain on, uh, strain on the trapezius which is a big triangle shaped muscle on the back and the rhomboids which come down to your shoulder blades and that can cause knots in the upper back and then the third movement up back down oh it feels good stretches your shoulders away from your ears that stretches the top of the trapezius which comes up over it comes up the back and wraps over the top of your shoulders shoulder issues can also be part of the cause of neck and jaw issues if you have issues in any of these areas keep the related muscles massaged and stretched make sure that when you play you're bringing the horn to you not leaning forward to meet the mouthpiece if you get frequent muscle pains, um, become acquainted with trigger points. Those are sensitive areas in the muscle or the connective tissue, the fascia it's called, that become painful when you kind of press on them. You can find trigger point maps online that show common trigger points for any region of the body. Um, so they'll show you basically where to press. Trigger points are really easy to target. Um, I mentioned the general approach earlier using your fingers or maybe a tennis ball if you'd like something uh, with a more intense targeting on a particular spot um, you want to find the tender spot in your muscle that's giving you pain and then press firmly on that spot for like 10 or so seconds that's called pinning it then you want to massage that spot in a slow circular motion slowly moving outward into a larger circle a little about arm health in your left arm, your fingering arm, we run the risk of carpal tunnel if we bend the wrist strangely inward. I advise keeping the wrist straight to avoid this. In the bell arm, we can experience pain in the forearm and also tennis elbow, which is pain on the outside of your elbow, sorry, and golfer's elbow, which is pain on the inside of your elbow. Oh, I think I've got those backwards. <laughs> For the bell arm, try to maintain a hand position that allows the forearm to rest with the bones stacked right on top of each other rather than slightly rotated 
either side. For both arms, I recommend these forearm stretches that I learned from a string player many years ago. You can do this against a wall or a table, or you can just hold uh, one hand with the other to do these stretches, which is usually what I end up doing. Um, first, I like to stretch my forearm with my hand folded down or in. Um, you can also rotate the forearm bones to get, let me do it this way, um, to get a deeper and more varied stretch. So I'm feeling this mostly up here. You can do that on both sides a few times and then turn your hand so that it's folded out. Hold this stretch for 10 seconds. For me, this is the half that usually helps the most. Um, and then you're gonna relax and do that a few more times and repeat on the other arm. My experience is generally that the first five seconds, it just feels like nothing's happening. And then the last five seconds, it slowly starts to release. So that's a good deep stretch for me. Lastly, mind health and emotional health. Don't be afraid to seek out a therapist if you have self-esteem issues that are not manageable with the techniques I've described here. I know a trombonist who started seeing a therapist because he wasn't getting anywhere in auditions. The therapist helped him see all the ways he was subconsciously selling himself short. And that same year, he won two huge jobs within a few weeks of each other. And now he gives a lot of the credits to the mental and emotional work that he did with his therapist. More importantly, he said that the work that they did has helped him even more in his life outside of music. There's no need to suffer from this common but treatable affliction. But without attention, low self-esteem can easily become depression. So it's absolutely worth putting in the work if it means a chance at living a more pleasurable life in the long run. We've already mentioned that activities that promote focus and relaxation are especially helpful for musicians. But there are also some full body awareness disciplines that can help you when things go wrong. So here are three such disciplines that have become more popular in the music business over the last 20 years or so. I just want you to know a little something about each one so that if you ever need this kind of approach, you'll know where to turn. Um, the first that we'll talk about is Alexander Technique. The Alexander Technique, um, which is named after its creator, Frederick Alexander, is, um, quote, an educational process that was created to retrain habitual patterns of movement and posture. It involves close examination of one's movements to remove any habits that might hinder the most balanced expression of the body. Um, as I mentioned before, Alexander was an actor who lost his voice and realized that it was related to, um, based on what I was told in my Alexander Technique class, um, a tendency to tighten his entire body on stage and lean back like this. Um, he developed his techniques to help him release that tension while he was in performance. Um, like I said, I took an Alexander class in college. You can also take one-on-one -on -one lessons, which often involve um, table work that helps retrain some of your body's basic movements. There's also the Feldenkrais method. Feldenkrais is another method that's intended to teach better posture and improve your quality of life by means of instruction and gentle manipulation of the body. Um, Feldenkrais suffered a soccer knee injury that was aggravated during World War II, and he developed his method of self-healing in response to that. As a result, uh, he was actually able to take up judo again. So there was somebody at my last school who was certified in Feldenkrais, and I got to learn a little bit and experience that with my studio there. And then the third uh, that we'll talk about is Astern patterning. So I got this description off the website of a friend of mine who's an Astern, Aston patterner. Aston patterning is a system of body work that combines postural and muscle assessment with targeted massage, movement coaching, and ergonomic training. The system has many applications from reducing chronic musculoske uh, musculoskeletal pain and improving posture to optimizing performance of complex activities such as sports and music. There are probably numerous other methods of body awareness and realignment that I don't know about, but these are three methods that have made the rounds in the music world and that have helped people that I personally know.
To close out today's class, I'd like to do a short segment on different careers in music. Um, I went to an undergrad that I would describe as an orchestra job or bust type of school. It was pretty clear going there as a student that people who won orche orchestra jobs were respected and those who didn't were not. To my friend Jess, a harpist who's one of my closest friends to this day, and to myself, this just seemed severely short-sighted. There are so few orchestra jobs available. Um, it's often like winning a major sporting event to get a spot, even in a small regional group, never mind a, an orchestra that's going to pay you a real full-time living wage. So we started a student advisory board, we got a faculty advisor, and we started planning a career fair where students could meet and question professionals from every corner of the music business. The career fair didn't get off the ground until I think the year or two after we left, and I'm not sure that they still host that event, but I know they were doing it for a while. But I am proud to say that the student advisory board that Jess and I started still exists today, 20 years down the road. Um, I think what Jess and I understood was something that, for some reason, our school did not at that time, which is that not everyone will end up being what they think they want to be when they're 19 years old. A lot of times, we don't even know what's involved in getting into a profession, or more importantly, the state of that industry itself when we choose to study it. Not every Everyone is cut out to win orchestra jobs. Not everyone who thinks they want to be a teacher will end up loving it. And furthermore, as I've mentioned before, lots of musicians work more than one job, meaning that it pays to have a diverse set of skills in a number of different areas. So today, I'm going to hold a little mini career fair for you so that someday, um, if you're looking for a way to diversify your skills in the music industry, or to change directions altogether, then you'll have a number of good options to consider. We'll start with the playing jobs, because they're the most obvious type of career goal for someone who lists their profession as musician. The top several tiers of orchestra jobs in this country are full-time, but most are part-time jobs. Players who win those top tier seats tend to stay in them for decades. There are also several full-time jobs in the country's best opera orchestras. All of these jobs require winning a competitive audition and then passing a several year trial period before being granted tenure, basically meaning that the job as, is yours as, uh, as, as long as you want it. Um, when a musician is essentially self-employed and they make a living from a variety of different gigs, teaching, etc., we say that that musician is a freelancer. Maybe they play in a variety of regional orchestras from week to week. Um, unless you win an audition for a particular group, um, then you'll usually get recommended to sub in for this kind of gig by being referred by another musician. But most people who play in regional orchestras are freelancers because they have to supplement their income that way. Maybe your freelancer also has a chamber music ensemble where they book their own gigs and set their own rates. Um, next week we'll be talking about my seven years as a, a member of a professional chamber ensemble, so we'll come back to that one for sure. Um, we also call musicians who play in certain specific corners of the music industry where they are still hired gig to gig freelancers. So two examples of this kind of freelancer are players on Broadway. They play on Broadway, they're hired gig to gig, but that's basically what they do. And musicians who record for the movie and video game industry, primarily in California. Though a lot of both of those kinds of players also play regional orchestra gigs and chamber ensembles and teach as well. If you want to freelance in either of those specific industries, Broadway or the movie industry, the easiest way is to go to grad school in the town where that work is being done and then work your way up by getting to know local horn players and building a positive reputation around your playing and your attitude. Now, let's talk about teaching jobs. Many of you currently have a goal of being an elementary music teacher or a choir band or orchestra director or even potentially maybe a church choir director. Um, for those jobs, you must, of course, get your undergrad music ed degree and get your te teaching certification, and then it's all about interviews. Um, your advisor will give you more guidance when you're at the point of applying for positions. 
Many full-time orchestral musicians, freelancers, and music educators teach young horn students in their own private horn studio as well. When Adam and I were looking for middle or high school private lesson students, we would hang flyers at the local music stores, we would post our contact information on databases for music teachers in our area online, um, and we would contact schools to offer a free sectional so that students could meet us and get to know us. And then we mentioned while we're there, hey, you know, we teach lessons if you're interested as well. When you're a private teacher, you should always try to set your rates at around the same level as other private teachers in the area who have your same level of education and expertise. Adam and I try not to set our rates too high because we believe that everybody should be able to afford music lessons. Um, if you end up teaching lessons for a company, perhaps because they have space available to hold lessons, then they may set your rates for you and you may have to pay them a portion, maybe a good portion, of each lesson fee. If you don't have a good place to teach at home, you could always suggest in normal times that you would be willing to travel to your student's home to teach them there. And in normal times, and of course in pandemic times, you can always suggest having lessons online. If it's your goal to teach at a university, then there is a long list of boxes you must check before that goal can be realized. You'll have to get a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and these days, if you want a full-time teaching job at a university, you almost always have to have your doctoral degree as well in the music world. The jazz department is the one exception I can think of because the jazz world hasn't had a doctoral degree for that long. It's just kind of started up in the last several years, uh, decades maybe. Universities are less impressed with a candidate that went straight through their degrees and more impressed when a candidate has all of those degrees plus a large variety of professional experience in their field. Um, I think of a bachelor's degree in music as the time for learning the ropes and I think of a master's degree as time for advancing your playing game. There's only one real reason to get a DMA or a Doctor of Musical Arts, which is what we call the playing doctoral degree, instead of calling it a PhD. PhD are for academic studies and um, doctoral degrees are for um, applied studies. Anyway, the only real reason to get a DMA is because you want the training and qualifications to apply for university teaching jobs. And yeah, hopefully you have a teacher that helps you become a better player along the way. I did. I was so lucky. Just make sure that you also have some performance credentials or other practical experience under your belt first so that that doctoral degree can actually help you get a teaching job. Lastly, here is a huge list of jobs in the music industry. Um, I know a little bit about how to get started in some of these career paths, so if there's anything you're especially interested in, let me know. And I'm sure you can find an expert, or maybe you know someone who can connect you with an expert in each of these disciplines if you'd like to know more information as to how to get involved with that area of the music industry. Um, of course, there's the music recording industry. So you've got music publishing, either um, recordings or sheet music. There's also music librarianship. Um, you can either be a music librarian with an orchestra or at like a university music library, which is like a you know bricks and mortar kind of library. You can be a personnel manager for a performing group. There's arts administration where you learn to help run and fund arts organizations like apply for grants. Um, you can go into music therapy. Um, there's instrument sales, construction, and repair. You can be a composer and arranger. And now, being a composer is its own discipline, obviously, that people go to school to learn how to do. But lots of musicians end up doing arrangements for their personal performance needs. Some of them are eventually able to parlay that into extra income. But if you decide to do that, make sure you look into copyright laws. Um, you can work at the Musicians Union. Again, the union is the reason why musicians have any say in their jobs, in their workplace safety, and in their compensation. I worked full-time as the office manager for the Musicians Union in Honolulu. There are also elected positions, which are paying jobs if you become interested in doing the very important work of the union and advocating for your fellow musicians. Um, Adams Orchestra, the Boise Phil, just unionized last year, and the change in group morale in working conditions and in fair compensation has been far improved from where it was before. So it's really important.
Um, there's education and outreach. There are lots of music programs that provide music education outreach to young kids or um, to communities that are not often exposed to classical music. Each of these uh, organizations usually has an education director, as does each orchestra that does education outreach programs. Most of these programs are funded by grants um, from philanthropic organizations, so there may also be grant writing involved with those kinds of positions. Um, there are probably many more music industry careers that I didn't think of. These are just the ones off the top of my head. And, and even, uh, you know, a few more. Uh, there are physical therapists um, that work with musicians and doctors that focus on musicians' issues, entertainment lawyers, etc., etc., etc. For this week's attendance assignment, send myself or Sean a recording of your jury or solo piece for the semester. Pretend that you're performing and remember to enjoy yourself. No need to be perfect, just to kind of first run through. Instead, challenge yourself to see how expressive and musical you can be. See you next week for Horn Class 13. Mm -hmm.